Um, Our ushers are getting ready to bring the uh, uh, attendance pads down, and as they do that, we want to once again invite and thank you for filling out the information that's there. That's so helpful. A couple of announcements that I want to lift up to you that are in your bulletin, but just to mention them. One is uh, make a note that uh, Cinderella's Closet is coming very soon. A lot of preparation going on, getting ready for that. And so I just wanted to mention that. This week we plan on being back to our regular schedule. And so you can see all the activities that are planned there. And uh, we look forward to that. The joint service between our church and St. John AME Church has been moved to next Sunday at 4 o'clock. And so I wanted to remind you about that. We'll have worship here in the sanctuary at 4 and with a wonderful meal to follow. And we want to invite you and encourage you to come and be a part of that. Uh, as we told you, uh, Pastor Jerome's going to preach, and that'll be, a, that'll be good. And we look forward to, to sharing with, with them on that day. Our confirmation class, it begins today. Uh, we had regularly thought we were going to do, start next week. We've moved it back to today. And uh, we look forward to that, but we request your prayers. This is an important time for these young people as they go through this period of confirmation. And so pray for them and pray for their friends in faith as, uh, as we go through the next uh, season of Lent uh, together through that. You can see all the rest of the announcements there. Take your bulletin home. Uh, make a note of that. I just want to say thank you to uh, everybody who participated in our Ash Wednesday, Sunday whatever today is, service, at, uh, at 10 o'clock. Some of you were able to do that, and, and, uh, and I thank you for that. But now it's the first Sunday of Lent, and we begin now by worshiping together. So let's stand, and let's greet one another. You may be seated. One worship note, and that is the opening hymn today is actually hymn number 519. Uh, there is a Lenten code to that. 154 is actually good, but 159 or 519 works better. It, anyway, I'll tell you about it later. We're going with 519, so just to make a note of that, okay? Friends, this is a joy to be in the house of the Lord together, so let's worship. <clears throat>
Please stand as you're able and join me in the uh, call to worship. We trust in you, O God, for you are faithful. Show us your ways and teach us your paths. We wait for you. Lead us in your paths of truth. Do not remember our failures. Out of your merciful grace, forgive us. You are faithful, O God. Your love is steadfast. We lift up our souls to you and praise you always. Please remain standing as we sing hymn number 519. We gather in this place today in this first Sunday of Lent and we bring to this place many celebrations and joys. We give thanks for safety and bringing us to this place. As the snow was coming down and the quiet of that, I was thinking about that verse, be still and know that I'm God. And uh, anyway, we're just thankful that we can be here together today. But we also know that our world is filled with a lot of need. And so it's good that we pray. So let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer.
Loving and holy God, as we gather in this place today, we thank you for the sun that shines, for the beauty of the earth, and for the goodness of your love through Jesus Christ. We gather here today and give thanks that we are a blessed people, blessed to share your goodness with others. And we take on that responsibility seriously. We thank you that you call us by our very name and you provide us with the gifts and talents necessary to proclaim your word. We come to you, O God, humbly, knowing that we're not always what you intend for us to be. We repent of our sins, O God, and we seek the forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And today as we pray, we, we thank you that your blessing is upon us as you forgive us for through the grace of Christ. We know there are a lot of needs in the world. We think about the sick and the hurting, and we pray, O oh God, that through the name of Christ, you'll bring that healing that only you can provide. Thank you for so many that you have gifted with the gifts of healing and understanding. We thank you, O oh God, that you're our comforter. And as we grieve today, there are many in our family that are struggling with that, and we pray that you will comfort us. Fill the void left in our hearts by those that have gone. God, today we, we turn our lives over to you in a way that, well, that's important in this life of this pilgrimage of faith. In the Lenten season, we think about our own selves. And we pray as we examine ourselves that we truly would be faithful to you. We want to be the disciples that you call us to be. But we also know that there are times in this life when we are not always what you intend. And so, Lord, Bless us. Move us in a right path with you. We thank you, O oh God, for the leaders of our, of our community and of our state, of our, in our country. We pray, O oh God, for the leaders of the world that they would certainly seek the peace that only you can provide. But God, today, we pray that your blessing would be upon us and that you would protect those who protect us. Be with us in this time of worship. May what we do here please you. And so watch over us now. Guide us, direct us, and give us your gifts of love. And we pray this in the name of Christ who taught us that when we pray, we should all say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
We want to invite our children to come forward now. Everybody doing all right this morning? Okay. We're in a <clears throat> we're in a new season in our church. It's called Lent. If you look around, you see things are a little different. Um, you know how on the altar, see, they used to have gold candlesticks there, and they're real pretty. But you see, now we have kind of plain things. And there was a gold cross on the altar. You see the cross now? It's a wooden cross. It kind of reminds us that we take this, uh, this six weeks or so before Easter to kind of look at ourselves. And we think about how we're not always as good as we should be. And sometimes we have to seek forgiveness, and we do. We ask God to forgive us of our sins. So the season of Lent is an important time in preparation for Easter, okay? Because as we say, Easter is coming, and so is spring, and we look forward to that. I want to tell you one other thing before we go today, and that is it's a secret about your parents that you may not know, but I'm going to tell you. Sometimes when you want to do something, you want to go somewhere, maybe go, go, to, go to an activity or something, your parents will say, not yet. I used to do that, my, right? I used to do that. My, I'd say, Dad, let's go fishing. He'd go, not yet. I'd have to wait a few days. Dad, can we go fishing? Not yet. Now, Dad's work, my dad was working hard, like your families work hard for you and love you. But I had to wait another few days, and I asked my dad, can we go fishing? Not yet. Sometimes in our lives, not yet kind of sounds like no, doesn't it? But you know what? It wasn't one... It wasn't long, though, that I asked my dad, can we go fishing? And you know what he said? What? Yes. And we went. What I'm trying to tell you is not yet don't always mean no. And sometimes when we pray, God will say, not yet. But not yet does not mean no. Okay? And I want you to remember that. Let's pray together, can we? We thank you, God, for your love and your blessing. Thank you for the goodness of grace and mercy. And we ask you to watch over our children. They are precious gifts to us. We ask that now your blessing upon their families, upon our, upon our church and our community. And may we always do your will. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All right. You want to go to Little Church? I think Miss Erica is waiting on you. What is your thing on your head? They're ashes. Ashes. We did ashes earlier today. I want the congregation to stand as our children leave and turn in your, in, by the faith we sing hymnal to number 2138. Pay close attention to the words. This is a powerful tune. 2138. Let's stand and let's sing.
Let us pray. Holy God, now as the scripture is revealed, we thank you, O Lord, that your blessing, your word provides for us everything we need. So move in us now. Strengthen our faith and make us more like you. May the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth now be acceptable, O God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You know, last week uh, when I spoke with you, I shared with you a little bit about the unexpected adventure of your faith. And the Bible says in Matthew 9, verse 29, it says, According to your faith, it will be done unto you. Friends, that is the key to the great adventure, according to your faith. In Mark 9, verse 23, it says everything is possible for the person who has faith. That makes life a great adventure. I'm wondering, how many of you would like to have a stronger faith? My hand's up first. Anybody? Yeah, well, we're all in that together. During this Lenten season, I want to talk a little bit about segments of our faith. And, you know, faith is like a muscle. Uh, it develops. You can strengthen it. But it can be weak or it can be strong. It depends on how much you use it. And so how does God build our faith? Well, God has set in motion a very predictable pattern, a very predictable process. And if we understand it, then we can cooperate with it and really grow in it and uh, grow in our faith. You know, friends, probably the question that I get asked more than any other question as a preacher is this. Why is this happening to me? I don't understand. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Why is this happening? And the truth is, friends, when we don't understand how God builds our character and how God builds our faith, then we're going to get discouraged. In fact, we may become resentful. We certainly will worry. We may become fearful about the future. We might even become depressed. And most of all, we can't, when we, we can't cooperate with what God is trying to do with us and through us if we don't understand. So I want you to get out your note page for today. And I want to look at phases of how God builds our faith. And the first phase is to dream. You might write that down. The first phase is to dream. God always starts with a dream. Nothing happens until somebody starts dreaming. You've got to have this idea, this vision, this goal, this ambition. You have to set your sights on some target. And there are a lot of examples of this in the Bible. I think about how God gave Noah a dream to build the ark. I think about how Abraham had the dream of becoming a father of a great nation. I think about how Joseph had this dream of being a leader that would save his people. I think about how Nehemiah had the dream to build the wall around Jerusalem. I think about how God gave uh, David the dream of building the temple. What I'm trying to say is nothing happens until we start dreaming. Now, how do we know when that dream is from God and it's not just something we're coming up with on our own, you know? How do we know that this is from God and not the lasagna we had for supper last night, right? Okay, so in Ephesians 3 verse 20 there it says... God is able to do far more than we would dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. My friends, listen. A dream from God will require faith. If a dream comes from God, it'll be so big, you won't be able to do it on your own. And if you could do it on your own, why would you need faith anyway, right? Right? God starts by giving us a dream. It's been, he's been speaking to a lot of you. I know this. You have a dream, a vision. It's in your heart and in your mind. It's a concept. It's a thing that will help benefit people. Where do you think that idea is coming from? Well, I'm going to tell you it's coming from God. And so God starts with a dream. But then we've got to move into phase number two, and that is decision. Write that down. Phase two is decision. You begin to do something about your dream. And nothing is going to happen, friends, with that dream until we wake up and we put it into action. We've got to make it work. In fact, James says, You must believe and not doubt because a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all that they do. Faith is a verb, friends. It's an action word. It, it, it's something that we do. And decision-making is a faith-building activity. You use your muscles of faith, you see. And during this phase, 
uh, uh, the moment of truth, if you will. It, it, it's the moment of truth in decision making. You got to do two things. One, you got to invest. It's a decision to invest. You've got to invest your time. You've got to invest your money, your reputation, and your energy. You've got to lay it on the line. But secondly, you have to let go of security. Ooh, and that's where it hurts. Because, friends, you can't move forward in faith and hold on to the past. You have to move forward, friends. It's like you've heard me say many times. If you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. God gives you the dream, and then you make the decision to do something with it. Number three, phase three, delay. Uh-oh, now it's getting interesting. Delay. You may not want to hear this, but God will not fulfill your dream immediately. God has not promised today to give you the dream, and then tomorrow fulfill it. Never has, never will. You can count on a time lapse all the time. There's always this delay, always this waiting period. In the book of Habakkuk, God says, these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. In phase three, you start asking, well, when? When, Lord? When are you going to answer my prayer? How many of you love to wait? Don't raise your hand. I know the answer. <laughs> Well, none of us likes to wait, you know. We don't like to wait at the doctor's office. We don't like to wait at the grocery store. We don't like to wait at the restaurant. We don't even like to wait for Christmas presents. We don't like to wait for anything. But most of all, we hate waiting on God. You know, it's really irritating sometimes. We think, God, what's the deal? Hurry up. We're ready. And God's saying, I don't think so. Every believer in history, friends, has had to go through eventually the university of learning to wait ultw you've heard of that yeah some of us haven't gotten our degree from there yet we're still working on that but why do we wait well it teaches us my friends to trust in god we learn that god's timing is perfect one of the facts that we learn is that god always uh, uh, says delays never destroy his purpose a delay is not a denial it's just like i was telling the children there's a big difference between no and not yet. Too often, though, we think when God says not yet, he's saying no. A delay is not denial. Listen, 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 listen. A delay never destroys God's purpose in your life. Did you hear that? Hello? Are you with me? A delay, a delay never destroys God's purpose in your life your life wow want me to say it one more time have you got it did you get you get it okay all right i'm just checking because that's what i want you to really go home with today you see the common reaction to this phase is doubt we start doubting we start saying well maybe i miss god's vision and how do we handle the waiting rooms of life well it reveals a lot about our faith and once we start moving through that delay period then we come to phase number four ready Number four is difficulty. Write that down. It's difficulty. Phase four is difficulty. You have delay, and then that moves into difficulty. Not only do we get to wait, but we get to have problems while we wait. woo -hoo! And there's two kinds of problems, two primary kinds of problems. You've got circumstances, and you've got critics. Hello? You know what? I see some of you nodding your heads. You can count on this. When God gives us a dream, there will be circumstances and there will be barriers. I think about Moses. Moses had difficulty, right? He led the children of Israel out of Egypt to the, into the desert of the promise, from the desert to the promised land. But he had one problem after another. First, there's no water, and then there's no food, and then the people start whining and complaining. And then there are these snakes that bit some people, and, oh, they just had one problem after another. And they were doing what God wanted them to do. And think about Noah. Can you imagine if God called you to build a floating zoo? How many problems would you have, right? And we all have kinds of problems that, that come along. I think about the Bible says that when Moses died, you know, Joshua was then selected to be the leader. Moses had led these people all the way across the desert for 40 years. And then Joshua leads them in the promised land. That's the easy part, right? No. <laughs> You've got to read on the next verse. 
Now there were giants in the land. <laughs> so the problems just continue. Even in the promised land, there are problems. Because God is working on our faith and our character. God doesn't give two hoots about our comfort, friends. God is interested in building our character. So why does God allow that? Well, in 1 Peter it says, At present, you may be temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials. This is no accident. It happens to prove your faith, which is infinitely more valuable than gold. Wow. So finally, difficulties become so bad that you've, got to, you've come to your limit, you're tired of everything, you're exhausted all your, all your options. Now you go to phase five. Ready? Dead end. Write that down. Phase five is the dead end. This situation deteriorates from difficult to impossible. It's hopeless. No way out, no alternatives left. And if you're at that stage, if you've got a dream and you're at that stage right now in your life, then I want to congratulate you because you're exactly where God wants you to be. Think about this, friends. Paul, the apostle Paul, he went through dead ends. Listen to the scripture. He said, at that time we were completely overwhelmed. The burden was more than we could bear. In fact, we told ourselves that this was the end. And yet now, we believe that we had this sense of impending disaster so that we might learn to trust, not in ourselves, but in God who can raise the dead. Wow, isn't that awesome? What a powerful scripture. That's something that ought to be on your desk, I'll tell you. If God can raise people physically, surely he can raise physically or people who are dead emotionally, right? He can resurrect a dead career. He can resurrect a health problem. He can make it better. See, God often lets problems become impossibilities. The disciples, for instance, they planned to follow Jesus. He was going to be the Messiah. Next thing they know, he's hanging on a cross, dead. Do you think that was a dead end for the disciples? You better believe it. For three days, at least. So at, what's, at this stage, we start to ask ourselves, well, what's really going on here, God? Did I miss your will? Did I miss your call? Did I miss your message, your plan? Is it really maybe just something that I did think up? I want to tell you the best example of this, I think, in the Bible is back to Moses. When Moses led those Israelites out of Egypt, friends, they'd been in prison for, what, 400 years? They'd been slaves there. And finally, Pharaoh, after, what, ten plagues, says, You guys, get out of here. I, good riddance. I don't want to see you all ever again. And they take off. The, the Israelites go. But then old Pharaoh begins to think about it, and he changes his mind. He calls his army together, and they take off after him. And then the Israelites, here they are in front of the Red Sea. Mountains on either side, Red Sea in front of them, and the army from behind coming to kill them. People, do you think nobody whined and complained then? Why, we could have just stayed in Egypt and died there. It had been a lot better, you know? Why is it that some people prefer bondage rather than risk? Hmm? They'll put up with a bad situation that's not God's will rather than risk and trust God on some situation. Why is that? The risk to be open, the risk to be free, the risk to, to confront a problem. You know, it's interesting, this is a little side note here, but when those Israelites were standing there at the Red Sea, you know where they were? They were at a place called Baal Zavon. Baal Zavon. You know what that means? God's hidden treasure. They were right there where God wanted them all along, see. They were exactly where God wanted them to be. I want to tell you again, if you're at a dead end, friends, then you're exactly where God wants you to be. God knows where you are. God knows your number, see. So what's the best response when you're at this dead end? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, He has delivered us and will deliver us again. Again? The psalmist in Psalm 27 says, I'm expecting the Lord to rescue me again. You see, getting, you see this pattern developing here? God does this over and over and over again. So that once again, I will see his goodness to me. My family, we've got to learn to expect positive expectation that God will lead us now in the phase number six. Ready? Write it down. Deliverance. That's number six. Deliverance. You see, at the end, God will come in 
And God will deliver. God does the miracle. God proves, uh, provides the solutions. This is what happens. In Moses' case, you know, God splits the Red Sea. You know that story. Uh, in Abraham's case, he and Sarah conceive and give birth to a child. In Joseph's case, all of a sudden, his dream comes true, and he finds himself uh, uh, out of being imprisoned in a dungeon, and he's being second in command. And Jesus... Jesus was resurrected. You see, we worship a God who loves to turn crucifixions into resurrections, dead ends into deliverance. Why? Because God is going to get the credit. Why? Because God will get the glory. And so the best response to a dead end is to expect God to act. So here it is. What are you, my family? What are you? What are you expecting God to do in your life right now? God's doing exactly what you expect him to do. The Bible says, according to your faith, it'll be done to you. My family, when we wait for deliverance, God will get the credit. God will get the glory, and God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray together. Lord, in the challenge, challenges of faith and life, we know you have a plan, and sometimes it's difficult for us to see that plan. But we pray that in this moment, we would have new faith, new faith that will deliver us. And so move us through these phases. And yes, Lord, we do, we will probably pray for that to be done tomorrow. Take your time, O oh God. And do your best work in us so that truly all that we say and do will glorify your name. We pray this with faith and confidence in the name of Christ, who is our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you to respond to the word by standing with me now. And let's turn in our hymnals to number 881 as we share the Apostles' Creed. And I invite you to join me with your voices as we now share in this historic profession of our Christian faith. Will you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Friends, our ushers are coming forward now, so let's prepare our hearts and ourselves to offer our gifts and our tithes to Almighty God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us dreams and that after we pass through the delays and dead ends that we will reach deliverance. And in our gratitude, we offer these our gifts to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's turn in our hymnals and sing our closing hymn together, number 452, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. go from this place we give thanks for this new day a day of new beginnings in this season of Lent and a time for us to reflect on the goodness of your love and grace give us now your peace peace that passes all understanding in the name of Christ we pray amen God bless all of you let's sing together God be with you